so let's talk about uh, uh, last bit of framing uh, before we get on to the rest of the semester. But let's talk about some of the, the key challenges we'll be visiting throughout the rest of the semester. Recalling again that our, our overarching question is, is, is this place, is this coastal zone too complex or, or, or too variable or too just problematic for us to manage robustly? So I want to start with um, some observations that folks have made over time. So we'll, I'll read you guys a few quotes here just to start us off. This is from 1812 in a book about the then history of the New England area, New Hampshire. And uh, in this book, in the, the, this historical review, um, the author says the fishing banks off the coast there are an, are an inexhaustible source of wealth and the fishing business is a most excellent nursery for seamen. And it, there, it therefore deserves every encouragement and indulgence from an enlightened legislature. In other words, this place is awesome. We need to do everything we can do to, to suck these resources out because it's just totally bountiful. Um, 1818, famous poem from Lord Byron where he's talking about the, the ocean. And uh, in this one excerpt, he says, Roll on, the deep, dark blue ocean, roll. 10,000 fleets swept over thee in vain. Man marks the earth with ruin. His control stops with the shore. In other words, the ocean is this massively powerful thing. We could never hope to influence the ocean. It's, it's beyond us. It's so powerful. It's so beyond anything we could possibly conceive of. Uh, famous scientist for us here, Thomas Huxley, says probably all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible. That is to say that nothing we do seriously affects the number of fish. Again, this is the, this is the, the standard historic view. When we were in little teeny wooden ships going out in the crazy, crazy ocean, didn't know about, didn't have satellites to track the storms, didn't know if you'd ever come back. It was a massively powerful thing, and we were very meek. We did not have the ability to guarantee that every time we'd go out, we'd come back, that every time we'd go out, we'd come back with what we wanted. Uh, more recent, uh, in more recent days, this is, uh, this is you know, modern, this is post-World War II, 1955. You think maybe we'd learn something? No. So here, uh, in this book titled The Inexhaustible Sea, written by some academics, it says, as yet we do not know the ocean well enough. Much still must be learned, which is true. Nevertheless, we are already beginning to understand that what it has to offer extends beyond the limits of our imagination. That someday, men will learn that its bounty, the sea, is inexhaustible. Right? Firstly, apparently only dudes will do any of the learning. But secondly, it's the same idea, right? It's this, this massively, th this, this cup we could never fill up. It's just this vast, vast thing way beyond our, our ability to, to mess with. And this is the 50s. Um, the same time, though, we're beginning to see, um, in, I mean, there, there was always some folks that had some bit of caution, but, but we're beginning to see in the same era as that, as that text, um, the, the growing concern that maybe that's not the right way to think about these things. And, and the most fam one of the most famous early people, at least for the coastal zone, that really exp expressed this incredibly well, are very articulate, was Rachel Carson in her book, uh, The Sea Around Us, which was her first famous book. You guys all think of Silent Spring, which is what my background illustration is about DDT, a funny c cartoon thing about DDT. Um, and, and certainly now that's what most people know her for. But really, she first got famous by writing her trilogy, these three books about the shore and the ocean. So in, in, in the sea around us, she says, it is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself. So saying that 
the C is still going to be the C no matter what we do, but the the ecosystem is potentially at risk. And this is this is a more recent. This is from the uh, 1980s, but this is a, a fisherman in Chesapeake Bay on the East Coast. Uh, which I like this quote. This is sort of somebody that understands what's going on. He says, most fishermen, and that's how you know it. Like we talk to farmers, like these other guys are totally screwed up. I, of course, totally know what's going on, but these other guys are, don't know what's going on. So um, this, this guy says, most fishermen think that Mother Nature brought us these fisheries, took them away, and that Mother Nature will bring them back again. The fishermen think that God brought us the oysters and that God took them away. I think that God brought us the oysters and people took them away. So the last quote uh, I'll give you, and then we'll, we'll uh, turn to some of our topics here, is, uh, so this is looking at Santa Monica, and this is uh, 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 noir. So even, even the, the coastal management even creeps into, uh, you know, 19, you know, post-World War II, uh, noir fiction. And so this is a Ross McDonald novel, very famous novel called The Drowning Pool. And this, you know, hard-boiled detective is having all the problems with the dames and the murderers and everything. So he basically jumps into the water off of Santa Monica Bay and he floats out in, into the water and he looks back at Santa Monica. And this is what he said. I turned on my back and I floated, looking up at the sky, nothing around me but the cool, clear Pacific Nothing in my eyes but long blue space. It was as close as I ever got to cleanliness and freedom, as far as I ever got from all the people. They had jerry-built the beaches from San Diego to the Golden Gate. They bulldozed super highways through the mountains, cut down a thousand years of redwood growth, and built an urban wilderness in the desert. They couldn't touch the ocean. They poured their sewage into it, but it couldn't be tainted. There was nothing wrong with Southern California that a rise in the ocean level couldn't cure, wouldn't cure. So that was 1950, right? So this notion of the power of the ocean as, as this un, indomitable thing that is either going to give us all this fish, take away all our waste, you know, somehow save us, was the dominant view for most of our species history. It's only in the recent decades that we've started to see the limits uh, and, the, and the incorrectness of those uh, earlier views. So there's lots of reasons for this. A world population, right? Jeez. How the hell is that not working? What's up, dude? So uh, I will not include that in the podcast because they always block me because Conservation International says it's copyrighted. Finish that, right? That's sort of the the reverse of those initial quotes, those initial thinkings of the ocean is for us to do with and we can't harm it, that's, that's expressing the, the exact opposite. That the ocean can do whatever the hell it wants to us, right? And, and, uh, and who, who knows? Uh, you know, Blade Runner will shoot you or something. Okay, um, world population, right? We know this, we're about seven and a half a billion people right now in climbing. So this is the situation we have. Obviously, we've talked about the, the concentration of people in the coastal zone. Depends how we define it. Call it a billion people-ish. In the course of our, our regular doings of things, we've been more and more efficient at finding more and more ways to harness resources and more, more efficiently harness resources and har harness greater quantities of resources as we go around. And so in this case, this is, this is energy um, captured by our society and everything is just going up, right? Uh, wonderful uh, website if you guys want to play around with this, really cool. Um, broken down into a, a large number of metrics in terms of our footprint on the planet uh, in terms of socioeconomic stuff, in terms of e ecosystem functioning, what have you. And basically, the pressure is going up in essentially all the metrics that we look at. None of them are going down. A few of them are sort of stable, but almost all of them are going up and going up exponentially. So that's the challenge of our time. So let's talk a bit about coastal stressors in particular. 
By a stressor, we're referring to something living or, or non-living, so biotic or abiotic, that has some type of constraint on the, the goings-on of things, on the ecological functioning of the system. The traditional physiologists talk about productivity, constraints on productivity, but it's really about any level of functioning. Changed how we cycle uh, uh, sediment through the system. Change how, ma how many uh, giant kelp individuals we have. What, whatever the, the scale may be, or, the, or the, the, the unit of interest may be. Over time, we've seen the nature, the magnitude, and the overall scale of stressors in the coastal zone change. Historically, you know, before humans were all that abundant on the earth, natural forces, natural factors were the, were the stressors. So, so the, the hurricane was the decider as to how many uh, barnacles we had on the, on the rocky intertidal this, this week kind of thing, right? The big pounding waves or something. Over time, though, while we still have those natural factors, those natural forces, over time, we've seen the rise of human-driven factors, of human-driven stressors. So that graph I just showed you about the ecological footprint stuff, you could imagine each of those as a potential stressor on the coastal zone. Also over time, particularly over the last century, our the, the scale, the temporal duration, so, so the, the, the time length, but also the spatial extent of any one particular stressor has grown. So the scale of these stressors have increased. To the point now that some of these stressors um, now seem to be challenging the very integrity of our coastal ecosystems broadly writ. And they're doing that by reducing the resilience, reducing the ability of the system to recover, to go back to its, the state before we disturbed it, and or messing with the natural or, or the traditional succession of things. So the storm would come in, nuke all the barnacles, and then in would come some ulva, in would come some little with green alga that would colonize it, and then you know, then the limpets would come, and then these things would come. So, so while that succession, the 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 pattern um, still is going on overall, because there's so much stress, you might not ever, let's say, get to the climax, the so-called climax condition in the successional state, because of the the scale, the magnitude of those stressors. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe that, that stressor is the number of people trampling on the inner tidal as they walk to go recreate it at the beach or something like that. And then, and ultimately what that can lead to is so-called alternative stable states. So a different, a different ecosystem in the inner tidal, a different ecosystem in the subtitle, a different ecosystem in the Santa Monica Mountains, that type of thing. Cool. Well, I'm not cool, but I mean, <laughs> but everybody with, me, everybody with me? Sorry. I got to be careful when I say these kind of things. Okay, so let's look. So we'll just run through a few of these, and I want to try to illustrate at least a few things with some of our data. And I want to have you guys start to give me some ideas here as we go forward. But to start with, here's data from last year's public opinion poll survey that you guys are going to be starting this week. Um, so we ask... Uh, at least last year we asked, hey, what, what's the major influence on our, our coastal zone, on the, on the resources in the coastal zone? Is the biggest driver uh, nature, natural stressors, natural forces, humans, are humans the major stressor, or is it both those things in some, some combination or neither? And this is what, uh, what's the number of people who responded to this question? One th uh, almost 1,200 people, this is what they thought last year. So we'll see if that's similar this year, for example. So most people, or the, the most common response is that it's both these things. Humans, you know, so maybe the human oil spill 
and the natural uh, winter storm, let's say, coming in and, and influencing what we have where. So if we add humans and both, that's just about everybody. So very few people, despite what you might read in the, in the silly political news and whatever, very few people, at least here in our part of the world, think that humans don't have an outsized role on the goings on of things in the coastal zone. Yeah? Would you guys have predicted that before I showed you this? So this is our survey. So this is Santa Barbara, Ventura, LA counties. That's our, our, our local, local hood. Local hood. How, how, what would you guys predict if we did this survey in, uh, I don't know, Shasta County or you know, up by Lake Tahoe? Or would you guys predict the same rough thing if, if we asked about coastal resources? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not nature or people. It's just the wizarding world of Harry Potter is doing this apparently. Okay, that's good. Uh, I think I think nature we probably have a few more. The people that don't live, we would probably say nature. Okay, so 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 a greater proportion of the nature column, which is roughly eight percent. Okay, all right. So what are some of the coastal stressors when you guys think about coastal stressors? Or, or, or things that could be, you know, in turn leading to changes or influencing abundance, that kind of stuff of, of, our, of our resources in the coastal zone broadly. But what are those, what are some of your ideas? So that we can uh, make a little bit of sense out of this, uh, out of these, uh, this potpourri of stressors. So here we go, here's four broad categories. Over harvesting. slash over extraction so so removing two removing things at, at too great a rate that could be critters that could be abiotic material but but uh, we oftentimes are most worried about the living thing so over harvesting invasive species so putting things in that did not that did not um, uh, they do not belong there. Overall destruction of an ecosystem or the fragmentation of, of an ecosystem, so outright destruction, outright damage to the landscape or the seascape. And then just general pollution. Okay. All right, good. So that was off the top of your guys' head. This is what... Uh, folks, I, I don't have the most recent data set. I just grabbed an old slide, but, but the numbers don't change very much from year to year. So this is our data. Um, summer, all the years added up up to 2012. And this is what we see. So we, we've historically asked three questions that we can, and we can assess people's um, opinions of. So let's start with coastal, where we say overall, rank the threats to the coastal zone. And we ask people, you know, greatest threat number one, second greatest threat number two, third, three, et cetera, and then we rank them. And so what you're seeing here is the average of those scores. These are all means and standard errors. So most of them, all you see is a dot because the standard errors are so small because our sample sizes are so large. So that's good. So that's say, that, that says that we can uh, easily, robustly distinguish these different levels from one another. Pollution is colored in this graph. I should have been smart. I should have used the colors on the board, but that would imply that I would be planning this out, and I didn't really plan that out too well, apparently. <laughs> but uh, in any event, so pollution is red on, on our figure here. Over harvesting is purple. Fragmentation, destruction is green. And invasive species are uh, is the dark blue color. So, right. So, so, so pollution is the big story here. P 
pollution year in, year out, when we ask people, what are the biggest threats to the coast? Everybody thinks that, that emissions, things that we're releasing into the environment um, is, is the problem. That could be heat, that could be sound, that could be nutrients, that could be radiation, whatever. And we found that trend since the 70s, since we started asking these questions. Everybody thinks the big problem is the smokestack. And to be clear, the smokestack is a stressor. It is a problem. It is something we have to deal with. But look at how big the difference is there and, but for the coastal. Look at that. It's, it's coastal, and then those other three guys are relatively close to each other. With wetland, a little bit uh, habitat outright destruction, since we're asking about a very specific, well-delineated um, type of area on the land the the green has come up the habitat fragmentation has come up but the order hasn't shifted right the priority the ranking hasn't shifted for fisheries we add on a couple extra factors so for fisheries you'll notice again it's all the same question it's just just uh, uh, the, the the driver is the difference um, but with fisheries we give them six choices instead of four We've added in ocean acidification and increasing ocean temperature, warming oceans. In reality, acidification, temperature, those are just different flavors of pollution. But people don't seem to recognize them that way. They, they, they seem to see them as some physical property of the, of the ocean. But regardless, Pollution is it, right? Pollution is still the mother load. It's what everybody thinks. However we slice it, however, whatever system we ask about, whatever location, pollution always seems to be what people are worried about. Does that make sense to you guys? Why? Okay, so, so it's easy. So at least gross pollution is easy to see, right? You see the stuff come out of the smokestack. You see the, the discoloration in the water. Okay. Easier to comprehend for people. It's easier to comprehend for people, sure. That I burn this thing, this thing goes in the air, and that thing maybe makes people sick or, or not feel good or something. Oh, so, so we perceive the harm on us more yeah. directly? Okay, yeah. I'm sure that's definitely part of it. Or at least fear for potential impact on us, yeah. Any other reason why people maybe flag pollution as a... Again, yeah, again, that idea that pollution is really this uh, conspicuous thing, or at least potentially is conspicuous, right? It's really easy to get our brain around. So it's an interesting argument that, that maybe pollution is, so, uh, is in everybody's front of everybody's mind because we all do it. I wonder if it's the opposite. I wonder if it's people don't think that they pollute very much, but they, they see the smokestack, they see the power plant, they see the cement factory, and they go, those bastards are polluting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we should stop that, right? Yeah. Okay, interesting, good. Okay, so we should keep, we should keep talking about that. Here's what you guys said on the first day, of, or whatever, I guess we did the second, second day of class. Um, where we, we, I asked you guys, what are, what are the issues that you think are, I didn't use stressors, we just said issues. So you guys listed positive things and negative things. So if we take the negative guys and we rank the negative guys, this is what you guys said um, when I didn't use the word stressor. So pollution was number one, tied with human population size. There you go, right? You guys said population two. Um, Policy was was a big issue. It was a big negative thing for you guys. Fragmentation. I, I, obviously, I bend your your ideas just like we did here, but um, but there we go. Yeah, we had aesthetics as a negative thing. I didn't. I don't. I'm not sure about that. But but um, but right. It follows essentially the same pattern. Right. Pollution is 
is the big is the big one. So whether we're thinking about it directly, whether we're thinking about it indirectly, whether we're talking about we, the people that are worried that, that, that are trying to put our brains around this or Joe Blow off the street, we all seem to to uh, cement ourselves around the primacy of pollution. Interesting. OK, so coastal threats. I think we can talk about these at, at three different levels. The first is the level of the individual stressor. So these things we're just talking about, the, the uh, armored coast, something like that. Then we can talk about how these stressors come together and, and manifest in, in the real world when, when multiple things are going on at the same time. And then another key threat is how all that comes together to maybe um, make it harder to figure out what we should do or what actions we should take. So we have the individual stressor, we have how they combine with one another, and then we have the, the consequences for that in terms of our potential response, our potential management choices. So let's look at these in a little more depth. So here are those five things plus an additional one. Now I didn't add on human population, which we possibly should do that. But I've taken those, those four things we've had there, and then I've added in a, a key fifth one, which is that notion of the institution. How do we make the decisions? So stressors, overharvesting, not in any particular order, overharvesting, pollution, habitat, fragmentation, slash destruction, introduced species, and institutional effectiveness. So, what do you guys think people, how, how do you think people are going to respond in our surveys to overharvesting? Do you think, think they're going to be worried about overharvesting? I think they'll be disappointed. Okay, we'll take, we'll take one minute. You guys talk at your table, your groups. I want you guys to come up with a, with a decision as to whether you think our questions in our surveys are going to, um, if over har how people are going to think about overharvesting. Big problem, medium problem, no problem. Go. <laughs> Okay, minutes over. All right, what was our decision? What was our decision? What did you guys think? Over harvesting, big problem. People think it's a big problem. So, so problem what? Medium. Okay. Ooh, so medium is the is takes it. Okay, so let's see. So this is last year. Now, now I'm partly doing this because we're going to start the survey on Wednesday, and so we did. I didn't get any suggestions for a new question or two. So maybe, maybe our discussion is going to make you think possibly about a question or so you might want to add. Just saying, just saying, just saying. All right, here we go. So here is a couple, a couple questions that deal with this over harvesting uh, question. One is we ask people is, and again, this is the 20, this is last fall's data. And uh, just so we're clear, not everybody always answers every question, right? So that's why the, the actual numbers of responses vary slightly from, from question to question. So for example, in the fishy, fishing management question, a total of 1,098 people actually responded to that as opposed to leaving it blank or skipping over that one question. Uh, so the question was, uh, fishing management in California is over-regulated, meaning we're doing too much, we're, 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 our hands are, are too, in too many pots, that kind of stuff or we're doing it roughly about right, um, we're under-regulating it. In other words, we're not, we're not uh, exerting as much management decision choices, actions, whatever it is, as we should be, or are we unsure? unsure. So every, there's always an unsure. On, on just about everything is an unsure, or, or they can uh, uh, opt to not answer the question if it's like, how old are you? But most of the questions, they have the option to say, I don't know. So what do you guys say? So does this, does this, does this support your, your thinking of, does this support your thinking of, uh, yeah? Fishing management, so the most common answer in terms of are we managing our fisheries correctly, about half the people say, I don't know, yeah. right? The, uh, there you go. And then the, this next question, uh, when we started this off, you know, 15 years or so ago, we said 50 years ago, but then I realized, oh my God, we're 
going on, so we need to not always be saying 50 years. So, so we changed it to 60 years uh, about a year or two ago. So, um, so the change in California's fisheries over the last 60 years. Have our fisheries, our, our fishing resources in the ocean gotten better? Have they degraded or don't know? And again, one of the most common answers is unsure, but way more people think they've declined and, and, and degraded than they have improved. So <laughs> there's always going to be some people that are pissed off. That's just kind of how it rolls with these survey things. It could be. It could be, although this is pretty consistent over the 15 years. Okay. It hasn't changed very much. But you don't know. I, but maybe I'm just making that up. You don't know. I, I've just shown you the 2016 data, so that's a bit unfair for me to tell you guys that. Could be. But does this support your thinking about what... what well, how you thought the general public were going to think about over harvesting? Because that's, that's what we're asking about here, right? Are we taking too many fish out? Yes, no? Yeah, I think a lot of people just don't know. Right, yeah. right. I think we should ask that. So the pattern is coming out, right? So if you ask people a general statement, they're like, they generally say, stuff's messed up. When we ask them, what about this specific action? What about the creation of this park? What about the goings on this beach, they tend to be more, they tend to be less negative when we get down to the specifics on average. Okay. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. I think we should ask the question, do you think we're taking too many fish out of the ocean? All right, good question. I think we should right, jot that down. Jot that down. Take a note. Mm -hmm. Take a note. Yeah, like dumb it down because people don't know what over harvesting is. Okay. Okay. Uh, when we ask about endangered species laws, and again, if something is endangered, by definition, it's going down, so something bad is going on. Now, it, it, could, be, it could have been endangered because of pollution, I suppose. But by and large, uh, the idea here is uh, the things that are going away, should we be doing something different? And this is our endangered species laws. So we say, should our current endangered species laws be eliminated? Um, not eliminated, but made less severe just kept as they are or expanded or or you don't know so by far and again this is fairly consistent from year to year to year but but uh, most people in the coastal zone think they should be expanded I have a strong suspicion that if we had to pick one question that was quite different inland versus on the coast since more of our friends inland ranch, uh, grow, grow plants and things like that, and maybe have a more uh, intimate association with the Endangered Species Act, they might, they might not, one out of every two people might not say we should expand it. Okay? All right, but, the, but, but I, would, I would argue if people say we should expand this, certainly they're saying, Hmm, there's, there's probably something bad going on with the abundance of these critters, right? At least the way they are now. Cool? All right. We'll do one more. We'll take a quick break. Okay, so pollution. Here we go. What are people going to think about uh, pollution? Are we, how are we manning our pollution? So one minute, you guys talk amongst yourselves. Are we doing a good job with pollution, sort of so-so job, or, or a poor job with pollution? This is Oh, now people are changing their votes. No changing. No changing. No changing. Unbelievable. Okay. So, um, so before we go on to pollution, let me just say, as a quick note, again, as a quick note, uh, I think it makes most holistic sense to talk about pollution as we typically think about it, because we talk, what we might call the proximate pollution, the, the, the heat, the radiation, the the nutrient but also i again i i think it's best to bin climate change within the umbrella of pollution that i not everybody agrees with me some people think that climate change needs to be in its own totally separate category but from a management perspective it's a pollutant uh, ultimately those those molecules are pollutants 
So I think that they belong here, but, but you, may, you may disagree and want to have a, uh, argue for a separate uh, column there, a separate category, excuse me. So here's one way to look at, at pollution. This is, um, we, we do have, California does have a cap and trade exchange where we try to um, deal with pollution in a market system and so so he, on this particular question we ask is is California's current effort to control carbon dioxide or I forget, we might say carbon emissions I can't remember how we exactly worded it um, via cap and trade a good thing bad thing whatever and so in this case we have our, our very bad to very good and then unsure and so this is what we see. We see, um, and, and this is a fairly common pattern, the negative to the positive, the negative is about twice, or maybe even close to three times, the, uh, or sorry, sorry, the negative views are about three times the positive views if we add up both those columns. But again, the unsure rules the day. So people are not familiar as, you know, these folks are busy going to their work, they're, they're, they're going to school, they're not necessarily keeping up with all these things. So these, these management things to deal with, let's say pollution in this case, are not um, front and center. Yeah? Is this like their reaction to it? Like they, <clears throat> like very bad would be like they, they disapprove of the cap and trade policies and they think they should it, it, Correct, them? correct. So, so, so do you think the things we're doing, do you think California, the, the, effort of California to control CO2 through the cap and trade effort is very bad, very good, like that. Cool. So, so here we say that by far most people don't have enough to make their mind up. But of the folks that, that did vote, um, neutral and negative are, are pretty, pretty even. So people aren't happy that we're trying to control this pollutant to, ah, I don't know, so-so. There's good, there's bad. Maybe they're not happy with the way they're controlling the pollutant. Could be, could be, could be. So again, maybe that argues for just asking straight up, do you like the amount of pollution we have right now? <laughs> That's sort of a loaded question, but. <laughs> 